and make those embers glow. But I've got happy feet. I'm steady walking like I got three commas in my bank account, living loud. So get your cameras out. I'll probably do the same thing if I was you looking at me now. I got this whole world spinning round to the rhythm of my heartbeat. Mm, put up your lights and keep on flashing. Don't ever put them down, down, down. Look at me now. Look at me now. Look at me now. Look at me now. me now. 
now I can't seem to focus And you don't seem to notice I'm not here I'm just a mirror You check your complexion to find your reflections all alone I had to go Can't you hear me? I'm not coming home Do you understand? I've changed my plans Cause I I'm in love With my future Can't wait to meet her And I But not with anybody else Just wanna get to know myself I know supposedly I'm lonely now No, I'm supposed to be unhappy without someone But aren't I Side. Mama says it's gonna get cold in the night, but if I picture you, then I'll be alright. I am ready. I am ready for you to be here. It's been a little while since I held your hands, so my arms won't stretch to your distant lines. Give me every person in the whole wide world And I'll pick you out in a second Girl, I am ready I am ready For you to be here For you Thank <laughs> you. 
Hello, everybody. Am I live? Okay, Sang, I need you to uh, check the mic for me and give me a cue that uh, we are live. Are we uh, audio visual? Paul, how you doing, Paul? You just got on. Can somebody give me a cue that uh, uh, audio visual all, all good? Good to go? All right. I, I'm going to uh, consider that a good to go. Hi everyone. Uh, hope everyone's doing good. How many people join right now? Ten people. Hey Lisa, it's good. Okay, Sang. All right, Sang says it's good. Fantastic. Wow. <clears throat> it's been a while. It's been a while that uh, uh, I did a LCS uh, late night coffee show. So I've been really busy. <laughs> been really really busy with the new clinic. Um, but I missed the late night coffee show, right? So it's, uh, it's, we had a lot of fun last season. We did a 25 episode. This is our 26th one, I believe. Uh, so we'll do another uh, 25 more to go and uh, we'll see where it leads us, right? Uh, so I just want to say hello to everybody. I uh, hope you guys are doing good. Um, once again, I apologize to uh, uh, those uh, fellow uh, Begin members who are in the East. They always complain that um, 10 p.m. Pacific Standard Time is just not that good thing for them, right? <laughs> right. But uh, I got to put my uh, daughter to bed and to my family, man, because I'm a weekend father. Um, I'm hardly home for uh, dinner uh, during the weekdays. I have a meeting uh, with my lab, treatment planning, case planning, and all that. By the time I come home, sometimes it's like... 9, 10, 11 o'clock, so uh, uh, I do have to dedicate my time for the weekend, so I uh, apologize about that. Okay, I hope you guys had a great day. Okay, so today is episode 26. Okay, right here. Let me go to PIP. Okay, all right, so here we are. Okay, so let's see who's all here. Okay, first of all, I want to uh, thank everyone for joining live. Uh, it will be another like, about 40 minute, 50 minute session. And there will be a one free AGD credits e point. So if you need those e points, please shout out. Okay, shout out your first name, last name, comma, and the city that you're from. Okay, so that we can match that with the uh, certificate. Okay, so that in case um, uh, AGD asks for the, uh, the the list of a member, so we have something of a proof. Okay, so uh, if you do need AGD, maybe 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 a lot of you don't need a, a extra CE credit, but if you do need AGD, which is a globally recognized CE credit form, uh, we can send out that certification for you guys. Okay, so please do shout out if you do need it. Okay, if you don't need certificate, then uh, uh, no problem. Okay, good. Who do we have here? We have Patrick, we have Tan, uh, we have Cam. How you doing, Cam? It's Calgary. It's kind of a late night, isn't it? Like a midnight there, right? Uh, Paul, Sanghu, Lisa. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Nasser is joining. Okay, uh, wonderful. All right, so let's talk about complication today. Complication. So this was a... Um, when I post a interesting case, and if I get a lot of response, okay, this one got us over 2,000 uh, reach. Uh, and I think uh, more and more dentists who does implant come to recognize that the management of complication is, is a necessary evil. Um, unfortunately, not enough people talk about this uh, happening because so many of us are trained to place implant, but none of the actual courses you know, go into depth of how to deal with the situation where implants fail, right? So hopefully today will be um, uh, another session of um, 
some learning, hopefully, right? Uh, at least uh, uh, it will be a, you know, maybe a pearl or two, because you know I I certainly learn from my own mistakes as well, and I have a ton of them. I have a ton of mistakes, so uh, I don't mind sharing my own mistakes as well. Okay. Now I call this the elephant in the room because <clears throat> in implant dentistry, we well not not just implant dentistry but general dentistry as well. We tend to show off our good cases, but we're kind of embarrassed to talk about some of our failures. But the reality is that we learn more from the failures than the good things that we do, right? Okay. I mean, I certainly have enough, uh, you know, uh, trophy cases, but. You know, I don't think uh, you know we'll learn as much from uh, those cases as we do with the failures, right? Now, the topic today, uh, I've kind of uh, you know nothing formal. Uh, I wanted to discuss you know why this has happened, and as you know, uh, I go through a lot of uh, implant fractures, especially with this particular brand, and I want to discuss a little bit you know deeper into today's you know, why is this happening you know why ET33.5 what makes this uh, implant so prone to fracture okay or is it just me maybe I'm, I'm a bad surgeon right uh, what are the other options okay if I knew know what I know now would I do anything differently right would I do anything differently uh, number three is some people say 3.5 diameter implant or anything less than that should not be used for central incisors because the walls are too thick. So the manufacturers are in general recommending four millimeter diameters and above for central incisors and you know leave those 3.5 diameter implants or narrow ones for lateral incisor. Is that true? Under what basis? So we'll dive a little bit more into that, okay? And also case management. How do we manage this case, right? Not only from surgically, but also prosthetically, but more importantly, managing the patient's expectation. Because this particular case happened about four years. I placed this 2017, and uh, it just uh, we just found out that it was fractured. So, you know, how do we deal with the patient expectation, right? I mean, a lot of times uh, those patients be you know choked to hear it, right? Uh, and how do you uh, you know salvage those relationship? Okay, that's important as well. So, let's go right here. Okay. Um, this is, uh, in a nutshell, how I dealt with this case. I ended up removing the case, placing a new implant, and uh, regrafting the, the buckle, a bone, and immediate temporize, uh, which I'll show you later, okay? So let's go back, let's rewind a little bit, rewind a little bit, okay? Uh, by the way, I'm going to enjoy my snack, okay? So uh, bring your snack, bring your coffee, okay? Totally uh, informal, non-formal. Let's have fun. So, several years ago, the patient came to get the implant on the 36 and 46 done first, right? That was first molars, so I placed it. While we were waiting for it to heal, what happened was the front tooth started to get wiggly, which is the number two one, which is the upper left central incisor, which had a history of a root canal, uh, and the uh, core build up in the crown, you start to get loose. So basically what it is, is uh, uh, the recurrent, a um, little bit of a leaky margin and the crown and the, the pole start to get loose, right? Okay, and we see that all the time, right? We see that all the time. And here, is, as you can see, the crown's getting a little longer, that means it's getting dislodged, right? So we took some photos and we check here, but you know, some, a lot of us talk about the shear forces, right? You know, in sensory incisors, the deep bite, heavy occlusion is always uh, something that we need to worry about, right? Because we worry about that the shear force, you know, a parafunction may cause the implant um, over torquing and, and failing. Um, that's certainly true. But in this case, if I, if I look at it, over jet, over bite is not that bad. I mean, certainly I seen a lot worse than what I see right here, right? Um, so ideology probably wear and tear a little bit of a possibly parafunction but you know with a little bit of app fracture that's showing there yeah sure we can uh, speculate okay speculate but do you, whenever you ask this patient do you grind your teeth or not how many patients actually say yes i absolutely do yes they don't know the realities right they don't know a lot of people deny it right even their spouse don't know Right, so the second question we ask is, when you get up in the morning, is your jaw sore or your neck sore or you know, muscles of mastication sore? Oftentimes, no, obviously not. You know why? Because a lot of people who grind their teeth, they don't grind heavily, 
is a very micro movement, it's a repetition movement. Okay, um, so you know, you know, we can probe the question, but sometimes it's really hard to get the right answer. Okay, and and a lot of it is, uh, to be honest, with the speculation, right? So in 2017, I I took the tooth out, I immediately placed the implant, and I immediately chair side uh, temporized in this case right here, right? And this is my temporary, okay? Uh, to expose that temporary. And I want to make a confession here, okay? Uh, in the post, people ask me, what implant is this? And I said, Hyosin uh, ET3 3.5. But that's not true, okay? Um, yes, it is the exact same design, but the actual implant was called ST. 3.5 millimeter by 13. It looks identical to Hyosin ET3, okay? But it's not made under the brand name Hyosin or Ostem. Actually, it's a different company which is makes the, uh, the duplicate, a copy of uh, Hyosin ET3 uh, implant lineup, okay? Because I started experience, experiencing fracture of uh, implant around 2016. I call that a curse of Glenn Van Ass, right? Okay, yeah, you know, it's an inside joke. Um, so in 2017, I come across a company, they claim that they make an exact duplicate of Hyosin implant lineup, but with a better material, okay? Better grade four titanium material. So I said, what is it? They said it's cold worked. Okay, so those guys who know a little bit of a uh, metal uh, properties, okay, exact same steel. There's so two ways to make those metals stronger, okay, than its original. One is by adding alloy, okay. If you can add another type of a metal, you mix it together, and and the laws of of uh, physics, okay, it will harden the metal by turning into an alloy. So that's why alloy significantly increases the strength of a metal. Okay, like a grade five alloy. Um, but the other way to increase the strength as well is called, okay, yeah, cold working. Okay, those guys who used to do the metal work when I was in high school used to do metal work. And how you do cold work is by putting, placing a metal, heating it up, and placing a cold and repeating. What that does is it makes the metal, okay, cold work, therefore increase its strength. Okay, so they claim, this company claimed that their implant is the exact same design as a ET3 lineup but with a cold worked metal. So I'm going, hmm, I gotta try this. So I placed about a dozen of these uh, ST 3.5 by 13, and I didn't have any fracture problem, and I started believing it until this happened last week, okay? Last week or this week, okay? Uh, so I was a little bit uh, disappointed. Okay, yeah, so uh, 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 people blaming Hyosin is actually is not a Hyosin implant, so I need to apologize for that. But the design is exactly the same as Hyosin ET3 3.5 by 13. Okay, I'll get more into that later. So in this one over here, it was a temporary, cr um, uh, we immediately temporized, and then four months later, custom impression was taken, and then of course, uh, final SCRC was made, right? Okay. So this is uh, four months later. Uh, is it a four month later? Yeah, okay, uh, x-ray and something happened in 2021, which is very recent. So fast forward four years later, okay? And a lot of this fracture case guys, they don't happen right away. They do not happen right away. They happen usually about four to five years later. And that kind of sucks because I give all my patients warranty up to five years. Okay, up to five years. Uh, so if we've done the surgery, the prosthetic, we cover from start to finish whole thing for free within the five years. If the patient was referred to my practice for surgery only and my referring dentist does the final, I cover the surgical fee, okay, and no charge. And my referring dentist, okay, you know, they'll they agree to redo the, the work for free. And the lab that we deal with, which is a SkyCat. Any, anyways, at that time, uh, honor that within the five years, okay? Yeah, uh, so there's no loss for patient, okay? Yeah, um, so, but when it starts to happen four or five years, it kind of really sucks, right? Or better, worse yet, if it happens a month after, okay, five years, 
warranty, what are you going to do? You still got to, you know, honor it because one month, right? So um, that's what happened. And the chief concern is this. My front implant crown is loose for past three months. This is another problem, right? When a crown gets a little loose, patient don't think it's a big deal. So they just wait it out. And then when it gets worse enough, they come. And obviously, the implication of that is significant because when it starts to get loose, right, it's torquing on the screw, okay, or worse yet, in this case, conical connections, is torquing on on the crust module. And as you, as you know, you know, any precision fit, as it gets loose and overworked, is going to cause fracture line, right? But another thing that I, that I noticed for this case here is that when I looked at it, okay, this, there was an open, there was a clearly a uh, um, uh, clearance, right? Okay, so we know that the, the prop, the crown moved uh, a little bit, okay? So why did this happen? Okay, clearly diagnosis is vertical root fracture of the implant, 2, 1, and I've had over 100 of these, okay, because I placed thousands of these implants, right? 3.5 um, ET3 type of uh, design. Um, and you know why did this happen and there could be a lot of speculation right okay uh, a lot of but the most common speculation that a lot of my colleagues seem to uh, give me a feedback is that the 3.5 diameter et3 implant or any 3.5 diameter narrower implant have a thinner wall okay and we make the speculation that narrower the implant in general have a thinner wall so in a site like an anterior incisor, you put a narrow implant, thin wall, they bite into things, and it's going to cause fracture. Okay? I mean, it makes sense, right? But the question is, is that really what happened? Okay? Well, we'll try to find out. Okay? So whenever you get cases like this, obviously, you cannot leave it like that, right? Okay, there's a fracture. Okay, it's going to get infected. Um, and one of the, the definite way to, to rule out a fracture from a uh, uh, differential diagnosis is that when you take an x-ray you want to take an x-ray without the crown because when you take an x-ray as you can see on the left side here with the crown it looks fine the bone level looks fine uh, the emergency profile looks fine looks perfect but when you take the crown out and take an x-ray you can see oftentimes the fracture is and it's almost always the fracture is either buckle okay uh, you can see it because it's, it's rarely on the interproximal. That's because, you know, the the the, the torquing goes buccal lingually, right? Okay. And and oftentimes nine out of ten times the fracture is on the buccal, okay, and not on the lingual. Okay, makes sense. So the question, next question for me is like this over here: Do I do this flap or do I do this flapless, right? Uh, if, am, am I going to use a reversing tool to remove this? Uh, flapless, which would be the most ideal, but it's hard to see. Or other option is make a big ass flap, right, so that you can see it, and you use whatever you need to use in order to remove this, right? Um, and even still to this day, the consensus on removing this implant, uh, this type of implant, you know, there is a degree of uh, of, of the differences, right? Some people they want to have a big flap, remove the the implant drill away the implant or bone and then do a huge GBR and then stage everything, right? So whenever I have a case like this here that I know that I have to re-explant the implant and redo the implant, I treat it like a brand new case, right? I don't rush anything. I tell the patient, you know what, I'll bring you back. I'll take care of everything, okay? Um, you know, I'll, I'll make it right. And, you know, trust me and then, you know, let's do it right. So. Um, we bring the patient, we do a complete workup, uh, photos and everything, um, and uh, we do the, the, you know, vitality test, I mean, the, the, the blood pressure measurement, you know, all that. We spend an hour get the record gathering, and then we're ordering the surgical stand and everything too. Okay, now here's a CT scan, right? Of course, I need CT scan because my goal is to remove this implant as traumatic as possible, and hopefully, replant it at the same time okay now if you look at it one of the questions that i ask i you know for for me anyways is how difficult will it be for me to remove this right okay because <laughs> over the years some implants give me more trouble than others um 
And the que next question is, uh, so the degree of difficulty, right? That's one. Okay. In this case, the degree of difficulty is high. Why is it high? Because this implies 13 millimeters long, guys. 13 millimeters. Okay. Now some uh, 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 surgeons argue that there's a reason why they use a short implant. Like you know, I, I had a consensus uh, on a on a big post. What's the their uh, go-to length of the implant? As you know, there were a lot of them. They said 10 to 11.5. 10 to 11.5. 10 if they're staging it, 11.5 if they're doing immediate, okay? Um, and I think there is a rationale behind that, so that in case they ever had to remove it, it's easier to remove because of the shorter the implant. For me, I've always wanted to like, place long implant for stability, okay? Because uh, I like to immediately load a lot of my anterior cases, so I maximize the, the, the available bone, and typically it's 13 millimeters, most popular, followed by 11.5 or 15 millimeters, okay? Yeah. So 11.5, 13, 15 are common, but 13 out of all th those three, the most common, you know, for me. So this 13, because as you, as you know, I optimize the the whole entire length uh, to the floor of the nose, right? 13 millimeters. So this is gonna be hard to remove, right? And there's an intact buckle bone. Look at that, there's an intact buckle bone, right? Because I place my implant palatally and I, you know, when I did, the, did this case, I did immediate um, a dual zone, so buckle bone is pretty decent. So, you know, it's going to be furthermore difficult for me to remove it, right? Even if I remove it, okay, even if I remove it, am I going to be able to place new implant at the same appointment? If I do, what size? Because I cannot go any more deeper, right? That's it. I cannot place 15 millimeter length implant because I don't have enough vertical height. Right, so that's another challenge. Okay, and the third is, what will I be using to remove it? Am I going to use a uh, Hyosin EFR kit or Megazen 911 kit, right? Or am I going to use a Salvin simple reversing tool? Uh, probably not, because that's going to to um, cause the uh, the implant to fracture out. Okay. Uh, am I going to use a trap fine, or am I going to use uh, you know different technique, right? So that's another question that you absolutely have to ask, right? Okay. If you guys have any question, please you know fill in, right? Okay. Um, so my objective for this was make the best of the situation possible, right? Okay. I mean this is ideal situation, but sometimes I cannot promise it. But I've been lucky. Nine out of ten times when I'm doing anterior cases, a broken, fractured implant, I was able to more than nine, nine out of ten times, um, almost always, yeah, I, I'm able to explant it, replant it, and then immediate provisionalize. Uh, that's what I'm able to do, okay, and that's making the best out of the worst situation, right? Because if I cannot do that. I mean, it's not really, I, I wouldn't blame myself for it, but I'd be disappointed because if I cannot put the implant at the same appointment for the anterior case, the posterior case, I can stage it without, you know, patient not going to hate me for that, but anterior cases, if I have to GBR, give a patient a flipper or removable and have to wait another four months before I can place a new, month, new implant and wait another four months wearing a removable, that's eight months eight months right okay so if i can do an immediate immediate provisionalization you know i don't feel so bad <laughs> right okay patients are more forgiving than not and of course you know within the five-year warranty that's what i do is no cost to the patient right okay um you know and a lot of my patients uh, are are okay with that you know they think that um Okay, it's not always uh, one person's fault, right? Okay, um, so this is the methodology. This is what I did. Okay, I decided to raise flap. Okay, raise flap and decided to use a reversing tool, uh, two body reversing tool. Okay, not single body. Single body reversing tool is like a Nobel Biocare or Salvin or other third party um, tool that you have a, like a cone. And then you reverse it. It, it. As you reverse, it grips the inside of the the thread and reverses out. I didn't want to use that tool because because there's a fracture already. When there's already fracture, when you are reversing it, it makes the fracture bigger and bigger. And those tools are not the right tool for this. Okay. Uh, so you want to use a two-body reversing system. That's what I like to use, which is a core screw, 
I did a, a, a lecture, Sunday morning lecture regarding that, so you guys can look up that. Uh, you'll, you'll find it on, on, on begin one of the posts. So you go forward about 100 newton centimeter torque, and then you have a reversing. As it reverses, it grabs the, it's got teeth on it, right? So as you can see right here, it's got teeth on it, it reverses, grabs, and it crowns the crest module of the fractured implant so that as you reverse it, it bites in deeper and deeper and deeper and prevents it from flaring out, okay? And the amount of the torque that it requires to remove is 200 plus, okay? But you don't wanna go over 300, okay? When you start to go reach about 300, the, the chance of the component fracturing out, okay, is greatly high. Because if it fractures out, then you're really toast. That means you really gotta drill a lot of bone and you have to use a luxator and you gotta, you know, uh, uh, extract it like you're extracting an enclosed tooth, right? So it gets really, really challenging. So the, 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 for me, these cases is predictably removing fractured implant with a minimal trauma. There will be a trauma. Believe me, there will be a trauma, okay? So I raised the flap because I wanted to use Dr. John In Sung, okay? One of the, the, the surgeons that I respect a lot and we did an LCS uh, uh, presentation, you know, watching his uh, video and he categorized, algorithmically categorized okay, how he removes the implant fixture fracture. So I learned something from him, right? So what I did was I put this uh, tool, which is a yellow EFR kit. Uh, yellow is a 3.5 diameter one matching right here, okay, right here, right here, this one right here. And then I use the uh, 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 the screwdriver to engage the core screw to over 100 newton, and then I'm using one of the the removal body to reverse it. So I reverse it, reverse it to 200. It was not moving. It was not moving. So what do I do? Instead of forcing further and and risk the rupturing, I decided to remove bone. Okay. Now this is where the controversy is. Okay. But if you think about it, there should not be a controversy. The big question is, which bone wall do you remove to reduce the overall surface area, okay? And if those of you who watched the, uh, uh, Dr. John In Sung's uh, lecture with me, I totally agree with his uh, method because that's the method that I use as well, which is I remove the, the strip of the buckle wall, okay? Narrow strip, okay? As you can exactly see right here, okay? I remove, whoops, I remove about First about three millimeters, and I try to torque over 200. Doesn't move, remove a little more with a 557. A Little bit more, doesn't remove. So I repeat that about a one millimeter increment until the whole implant reverses out in one piece. Okay, that's how you do it. Okay, that's how you do it. Okay, how do you know when you get 200 newton centimeter torque? Great question, okay. Uh, you know because the, the torque wrench it's a separate torque wrench. It com comes in 100, 150, 200, 250, and 300. It's a heavy duty torque wrench that the kit comes with, okay? Yeah, every removal tool, a Korean brand, they come with a, a separate torque wrench that you can read off that, okay? Yeah. Uh, and then if you see it carefully here, you see that there's a crack line right there. It's a crack line right there, but the, the teeth of this is crowning it. So it's preventing from rupturing out, okay? Yeah. So. Very, very good tool. Another good tool is a 911 kit, same mechanism. Same mechanism does exactly the same thing, okay? So here you are, after I took it out, there is a buckle bony defect. But the key thing that you guys look over here, there's no interproximal bony defect. This is key, okay? Buckle tissue, we can regenerate. Buckle bone, we can regenerate. What we cannot regenerate is interproximal, okay? If you use interproximal bone removing and if you accidentally remove the bone height of the adjacent tooth, you're toast. You're gonna to lose those interproximal papilla, 100%, okay? Yeah, so it is absolutely important that, that, that you do not sacrifice interproximal bone, okay? So for me, I know I can regenerate buccal bone using a sticky bone, I'm gonna share that with you, okay? Yeah, so, this is the reason why nowadays I'm flapping more than non-flap because when you non-flap, you can you don't know how much to reduce the bone. Okay, if you just torque it uh, like a barbarian, 
sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you don't get lucky, and when I don't get lucky, then I gotta raise a flap again anyways, it is a big mess, and I got a, you know, big, big, big destruction, and sometimes I cannot put the implant in, right, okay, so I rather, um, so my, my, my thought process is, remove as least amount of bone as possible, and as much as necessary okay all right so i go in an increment okay and it's systematic approach this way you minimize the bone destruction okay let's talk about this right here okay let's talk about this right there are some every time i post a fracture case on a facebook on my facebook Few of the surgeons always say this: 3.5 millimeter implants are not suitable for central incisors, and 4.0 millimeter implants are more suitable for central incisors, especially when it comes to ET3, highest ET3 system. Why are they saying that? And is, is does this have a you know? And I ask them, why do you say 3.5 is not suitable according to the manufacturing? Really? According to manufacturing, how do they know? What's their uh, 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 reasoning behind and the manufacturing reasoning behind this according to those uh, uh, surgeons saying that the 3.0 millimeter implant ET3 okay conical wall has a thinner wall than 4.0 therefore thinner wall more prone to fracture therefore you should not use a 3.5 for central incisors it's only for lateral incisor and a 4.0 the wider diameter implant has a thicker wall therefore it should be Use on the central incisors. Really? Are you sure about that? Because I'm going to show you. I'm going to prove it to you. That is totally false. Okay? Totally false. Anyways, I took that implant out and I placed a 4.4 by 13 Megagen any one implant. 4. Point, which is actually the diameter on the top is a 4.3. Okay? Zero additional drilling. Zero additional bone depth. I took the implant out, put a new implant in, and clean surgery. And I got enough torque. It torqued at 45, right? Okay. Let's look at the ET3 implant. Okay, guys? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Anna says, what about uh, slight interproximal? This is a very good question. Anna says, pretty good question. Anna says, what about slight interproximal trough next to implant if facial not enough? You could. Slightly. Just like, uh, I think, Anna, you watched that video with me, right? Just go buckle a little bit, and you can go slightly. The key is, though, you don't want to go all the way into proximal. Try not to, unless there's enough room. If there's enough room, of course you can do that without damaging the uh, neighbor tooth uh, into proximal bone height. Okay, yeah. But, again, right? Okay, you go you go semi-circle, almost at the most semi-circle, and you re remove enough surface area, and it will pop right out. Okay, yeah. Good question. Let's look at the ET3 system together, guys, okay? Because I, I know ET3 inside out. I placed at least how many thousand, okay? At least 10,000 of those, okay? Yeah, easily, okay? So people think that I don't know ET3 system, okay? I hate to, to tell you, I know ET3 inside out. I was one of the key opinion leaders for ET3 system, Canada nationally, internationally, globally. Okay, I spoke for uh, Hyosin at a world symposium numerous times, right? I even did a lecture on how great their implants are for anterior cases, okay? The design-wise. And to be fair, their design is very good, okay? Their biological design, designed for biological he healing and, and the bone maintenance is probably one of the best. The problem is their design is not the best when it comes to structural integrity. So two different things. Okay, a lot of implant company they make a structural integrity design is good, but they suck at maintaining bone, right? So uh, there's a two sides to the sword. There's a two sides to the coin. Okay, yeah. So we gotta give a uh, implant uh, system uh, uh, where the credit is due. Okay, but also criticize what is not good for. Okay, yeah. There's no such thing as a perfect system, right? One important thing not about ET3 system is that it's got two connections, okay? There is a mini connection and there is a regular connection, right? Whereas an anyone, okay, is a, more of a one connection, regular connection from 3.5 all the way to 7 millimeter, okay, mega gen, anyone is a one connection, right? Same conical connection, 
okay, compatible but one connection. Whereas a Hyosin, they took a smarter approach, okay, they took a uh, smart approach which is from 4.0 all the way to their 7 millimeter has a regular connection, okay, whereas their mini connection is for their implant lineup diameter of 3.5 and 3.2, okay, right, why did they do that? Because on the 3.5 and 3.2, because the implant is narrower, they wanted the connection to be narrower so that their wall will be thicker. Okay, because if you use the regular connection onto a their 3.5 or 3.2 lineup, their wall will be much thinner. Do you get it? Okay, so it was smart, smart designing. Okay, they're not dumb company guys. Okay, yeah. So if you look on the bottom, okay, this is another thing. So also another thing, guys. When an implant company says our implant is 3.5 diameter implant, our implant is 4.0 diameter implant. No, they're not. Okay. Their implant, actually, the widest part is 3.7, okay, for the 3.5 diameter implant. Their widest part for the 4.0 diameter implant is 4.2. It's slightly wider, okay, yeah, that's that's the, the, the wider part, okay, yeah. And, and magazine anyone is no different, okay, their implant, when they say 3.5, is actually like 3.8 or something like that. I'll show you, okay, yeah. Now. Let's do some calculation, okay? Because this will blow you guys, you know, blow your mind away, okay? Yeah. ET3 mini diameter is 3.5, but their actual diameter, as you can see right here, is 3.7. And their connection, okay? Their connection, as you can see here, is 2.8 hex connection, all right? Whereas their uh, um, uh, regular connection, which is 3.35, okay? Which is, makes sense because the regular connection is wider. The 3.35 and mini connection is only 2.8. So if you do mathematics, 3.7 minus 2.8, okay, 3.7 is the widest part on the top, okay, because it's a straight taper, okay, top is 3.7 minus 2.8, which is 0 0.9. You have to divide by 2, okay, because on both sides, right? So the each wall, each wall is 0 0.45, okay? Does that make sense to you? 0 0.45. Remember that number. Okay, remember that number, right? And if you calculate the ET3 regular platform, 4.0, okay, 4.0. Their 4.0 is actually 4.2 on the widest part, top of the crest module. You take away the 3.35, which according to their uh, measurement, okay, you do that, 4.2 minus 3.35 is 0 0.85, okay? And then you that difference, you divide it by 2, that will give you each side of the wall, which is 0 0.425. Do you see the significance here? 4.0 diameter ET3 implant has thinner wall thickness than the mini. So their argument saying that their 3.5 diameter implant ET3 mini has a thinner wall than a 4.0 is a bullshit. Okay, All right? Their wall is actually on the mini is thicker than their regular platform 4.0. So they saying that 4.0 use it for central and use a 3.5 diameter implant ET3 on the lateral. They have no substantiated engineering reasoning behind it. Okay, right? There's no reason behind. So if they're arguing that it's a wall thickness that's causing the fracture of the the mini implant, that's not true. Because here, according to this here, it has a 0 0.45 and the other 0 0.425. You might say, oh, that's such a little no. When it comes to engineering, guys, okay, metal, that is a huge difference, okay? That's a huge difference, right? Okay. Everybody follow me here, all right? Let's look at the anyone. Let's look at the anyone, okay? Anyone in plan, okay, is very similar. It's very, very similar to Hyosin ET3. Okay, they are direct competition in Korea. Direct competition. Okay, yeah, All right. Okay. So what happening is here? Okay, yeah. So what happening here is though the key difference, the key difference right here, is that Hyosin uh, anyone Megagen has a straight taper on the top here, three millimeter top three millimeter they don't taper, whereas the ET3 taper straight taper anyone it goes straight down parallel before it tapers. 
So these are the design that I call it a dual taper, not a straight taper. Okay. So what it means is that, okay, even though it is a taper, the first three millimeter, there is a along the wall where the conical connection is, the wall support is thicker because it doesn't taper out. Okay, early enough, right? These dual taper implants are harder to place. Okay, because what happens is the last three millimeter when you're placing the implant, okay, countersinking, it tends to buckle it tilt out. Okay, just like a Nobel BioCare um, or replace systems, you know, used to you know buckle it kick out, right? Unless you profile the palatal wall. Okay, similar situations here as well. Okay, but it makes a significant difference. See that right here? Okay, because when a connection is like this here, and when you go straight taper, straight taper, right? When it reaches down here. It gets quite thin, right? So if you look at the anyone 3.5 and anyone 4.0, and you do a similar measurement, anyone 3.5 is a 3.9, 3.9 millimeters, okay? And then minus 3.1, okay? You see that anyone uses a same same uh, uh, connection, regular connection, okay? All right, but it doesn't sit all the way down. It it goes a little bit shallower to maintain the, the wall thickness. And when you measure that, that's a 0 0.8, and you divide it by 2 is 0 0.4. It's only 0 0.4. Only 0 0.4, right? It's actually less than ET3, um, ET3 uh, regular and ET3 mini. It's only 0 0.4, right? Yeah, okay. And anyone here, Regular is 4.3, which is a 4.0, but it's 4.3 minus 3.3, and then you take away is 1, and divided by 2 is 0 0.5. This is much thicker than the counterpart of Hyosin ET3 4.0, okay? Yeah, so anyone 3.5 is actually narrowest of all of them, but anyone 4.0 is the widest of all of them, all right? Interesting, huh? Okay, so let's do a comparison here. Let's do a comparison here, okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Ryan says shorter radius increase the PSI for a uh, smaller fixture. In some way, true. But if you compare that to any uh, a MegaGen anyone 3.5, okay, why is uh, a MegaGen anyone implant uh, has show a far less fracture, right? Okay. Hyosin recommends a lower insertion torque for the mini connection, which may be the reason to cause screw loosening uh, under cyclic loading. I think so too. You know what, Patrick? When they first introduced the Hyosin ET3 2.5, they didn't have that lower insertion torque. Okay, they didn't have that warning sign okay, when they first came in. Right? It's an afterthought. It's an afterthought, man. Okay. Yeah. So I was one of the very first one. Me and Dr. Jin were the very first one to confront Hyosin that you guys should. Stop making this implant design using a grade four uh, um, regular pure titanium, right? Because their 3.2s, the narrowest implant, their narrowest implant 3.2, zero fracture. And I placed over a thousand of them, guys. Their 3.2. If you say what's the best implant design of Hyosin ET3, is their 3.2 implant. I'm here to make a statement that their 3.2 might be stronger than the Strawman 3.3, right? Okay. Because I've had a 3.3 fracture on me but never 3.2, okay? Yeah, and when I place 3.2, right, loading, I don't load at like 15, 20, like what they recommend, the final prosthetic screw, I torque at 30, okay? What we, people don't understand is that alloy implant, they say that 30% higher strength in the alloy, I think it's way more than that, okay? It's way more, uh, to a strength of an alloy implant. And some of you might ask, you know, why doesn't a Hyosin and Megaten use the alloy uh, metal then for the strength? There's a reason why. Anyways, guys, let me finish this right here. Okay. So 4.0 diameter implant of ET3 has thinner wall thickness than any of these, right? Okay. It's got um, uh, uh, between those two. And if you compare all three of them, ET3 mini has a 0 0.45. ET3 regular has a 0 0.425. Anyone 3.5 down fixture has only 0 0.4. Of course, anyone regular through 4.0 has a thickness, which is 0 0.5, all right? Okay. But then why does mini 3.5, okay, out of all these, 
have highest breakage. Okay, what's the cause? Okay, that is the biggest thing, right? That's the biggest thing because I place significant number of these, all of them, right? And why this happening? It's not just me, Bernard, Neki, Hoyoung. Okay. Disclaimer: I cannot speak for their implants in the United States. Okay. Yeah, maybe it's just a Canadian thing. All right. Okay. And maybe you know American U.S. version of the ET3, uh, they make it stronger. Who knows, right? So I'm just speaking for uh, made in, you know, made for Canada. <laughs> All right. So speculation. This is highly speculation, guys. Okay. Don't take it to the bank. Right. Okay. Both connections are 22 degree, 11, 11. Okay. They are literally compatible. They're regular platform, not the minis. Okay. The key different feature for me is a straight taper. Straight taper of a uh, anyone Mega Gen. That three first three millimeter, the parallel, okay, that might be got to do with something, okay. Number two is a grade four versus grade four cold welding, okay. I don't know if this is true because their ST lineup, which is a copycat of a Hyosin 3.5, I got a fracture on that one too. Although it's only one, all right, one out of the dozen that I placed. I don't think the cold welding of the narrow implant makes that much difference. Alloy will. But I don't think cold welding for a thin wall, I don't think it makes that much difference. Okay. Number three, defective manufacturing process. Possibly. Okay. Possibly. Right. Um, so I just wanted to explain these things to you. Okay. So, you know, people think that Hyosin ET3 4 millimeter diameter implant has a thicker wall. It does not have a thicker wall. Okay. It does not have a thicker wall. And in fact, it's got a thinner wall than mini ET3s. Okay, so if they're arguing about the thinner wall of a 3.5, I don't think that's not true. That's just physically not true. All right, uh, but nevertheless, okay, ET3 3.5 is notorious for fracturing. But at the same time, all the 3.2 implants that I placed for Hyosin uh, uh, ET3 system, 3.2 diameter, which I still use a lot of for the lower incisors, upper laterals, okay, they're they are a real workhorse for me. Then somebody ask you, why don't you use then Hyosin 3.2? Can you use Hyosin 3.2 for all the central incisor? I place enough central incisor 3.2 Hyosin, okay? Because because I you know there's situations that I'm real desperate and I didn't want to use their 3.5, okay? So I was using 3.2 for a while. Zero fracture. The problem is it's a different type of uh, failure because when you are immediate loading with a 3.2 on a central incisor, okay, you don't have enough surface area. To get a high enough of a of a surface surface uh, um, uh, torquing, okay, uh, and also their 3.2 alloy, okay, alloy treat treatment of SA surface. I don't think is as bioactive as a pure titanium. Okay, that's just that's my my uh, anecdotal anecdotal. So I had a higher surgical failure, not integrating failure. Okay, then the, uh, the the pure gray titanium, but once it's integrated, as far as the strength is concerned, okay, 3.2 has been absolutely a tank. Okay, that's why I still use a lot of 3.2. Okay, I think that's a, uh, one of the best uh, narrow design implant uh, that any implant company uh, uh, manufactures. Okay, so how are we doing with time? Okay, all right. 3.5 millimeter implants are not suitable for century incisors. 4.0 implants are more suitable for century incisors. That, that's not true, because before Hyosin, before uh, Mega Gen, I've placed a ton of Nobel implant 3.5s. Because you guys understand Nobel, okay? Especially Nobel, replaced Nobel Active. Uh, back then, uh, their their narrow implant was only 3.5, okay? Or if you're using Brandmark external head, you have 3.3. And external hex Brandemar had 3.7 and 4.0. But if you're using uh, internal connections, you had 3.5 and 4.3. There was no 4.0. So it's either you use the central incisor 3.5 or 4.3. What are you going to use? 4.3 is way too big. So we end up using 3.5s a lot for central incisors. Okay. And I've placed a ton of those too. I might get screw loosening, but not fracture like the ET3s. How do you explain that? Okay. How to explain that? And even those uh, uh, manufacturers of Nobel, they said 3.5 is ideal. 
Why is narrow implant ideal for anterior aesthetic cases? Because it helps to maintain interceptal bone peak and embrasure space tissue height. That's why. You start using wide and start going to biological width invasion and you end up losing bone interproximally. That's why. That's why there's a significant advantage of using narrow implant, okay, if the implant can, can handle the strength, okay. If I were to use a wide implant here, I will lose this uh, papilla. Okay, I covered this extensively at my workshop. Okay, uh, advanced uh, uh, implant residency. Okay, so this is not true. Okay, right? It's not true. Yes, it's a biomaterial lecture tonight, guys, because I'm, you know, I don't claim to be a, 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 a okay, Doreen Roos, but I know enough from my experience. Okay, from my experience, right? So how did I handle this case? I put 4.0, press power as possible, and then uh, depth control with the 4.0 healing abutment height, um, and with the uh, sticky bone. Because of sticky bone, I'm very confident of rebuilding bone. I've done it a thousand times, okay? Yeah, as long as the implant is positioned within graft envelope. That's why the position is very important, okay? Position is very important. And I can re-create re, uh, that of bone loss right there because it's a three wall defect is is a highly um, uh, uh, high blood flow um, uh, three wall defect that is a piece of cake for uh, for sticky bone right and then uh, sticky bone okay need I say more okay and then uh, uh, suture using a monocryl okay 5.0 5 monocryl and then chair side temporary make the chair side temporary and uh, screw retained uh, provisional crown. And then, here we go, right? Okay, yeah, check the butt. I made the two slightly shorter, but more importantly, okay, and I use the remote incision. When I do this, I like to use remote incision to optimize the blood flow. And then here, I made, uh, yeah, I made the uh, Essex with uh, with um, uh, a window cutout. Okay, this is the same surgical stent that I used to play, position the implant, verify the position of the implant that I cut out the incisal portion so the patient can wear it as a temporary night guard. Okay, so that it um, takes the uh, uh, nighttime excursion out of the equation so that my patients don't uh, break their temporary uh, accidentally. Okay, All right. So conclusion, right? So the conclusion is this, right? Anterior complication management, it is high risk. Uh, I used to lose sleep over these things, okay, but not anymore, okay? I, I got so good at it. The problem, the good thing about my job is that I get to do a lot of these. So uh, once you have about 100 of these uh, fracture cases, you're not worried anymore, okay? It's just another what, one hour of your of surgery and you know, prosthetic, um, and it's not a big deal, okay? As long as you can manage patient's expectation and manage their disappointment, Okay, it's, it's not, a, you know, it actually strengthens your bond with the patient that even after four years, five years, you, you're still willing to do this, right? Okay, for the patient, right? It means a lot to them. Okay, they refer you more patient. Fractured implants must be explanted. Okay, some of the, the doctors uh, in the past say, you know, leave the fractured implant. No, you can't, man. No, you can't. They always get infected. You got to take it out, okay? If you don't know how to take it out, refer to somebody who can take it out, okay? Not everybody knows how to take this out well. Okay, um, I follow Dr. John Insung's protocol. That is probably the best predictable protocol. Okay, um, you know, watch his video if you guys haven't watched it. Um, a lot of pearls. I mean, he talks so fast. Okay, but there's a lot of pearls in his uh, lecture, and he comes up with a lot of good protocols, right? Yeah. And number four, if needed, buckle bone can be sacrificed. Okay, controversial? No, not really. Okay, it's no different than me doing an immediate anterior when the buccal bone is missing. Do it all the time. You can regenerate it, okay? So if needed, buccal bone can be sacrificed, okay? And a little bit of proximal as long as you don't sacrifice the interproximal bone of the neighbor teeth, okay? It is the neighbor teeth bone height that is what's going to make it, okay? Number five, PRF sticky bone used to rebuild buccal bone, okay? You can do without sticky bone. It'll be harder, okay? It's more work. You gotta use a membrane and other stuff, okay? Uh, but if you know how to use PRF sticky bone, this is very, very simple. Number six, understand implant design, okay? It's not manufacturer's responsibility, guys. It's our responsibility. It's our responsibility to understand the implant design and how we're gonna use it, 
okay yeah because a lot of the manufacturings okay you cannot say that they've done all their do homeworks right okay so uh, you know use wisely choose wisely and use wisely all right okay so that uh, pretty much brings to a conclusion of today okay um <laughs> Samuel goes I you know glad you didn't place the enough 3.5 well glad for you as well uh, and some people are asking how would Megagen 3.5 fare uh, against the ET3 3.5 so far I've placed my longest in Megagen anyone 3.5 is about four years uh, that means remember I told you guys it happens after four to five years so next one year is gonna be a make it or break it right okay so I'll let you know because I placed a you know, a lot of those a lot of those okay so uh you know definitely uh if the mega implants start to show fracture i will post that on the begin too i'm merciless when it comes to uh implant fractures i don't care i do not uh have a bias or mer mercy against any implant company okay my job is to tell you the truth from my experience okay yeah, my experience, right? So if anyone's uh, implant 3.5s are showing fracture problem, I'll stop using it. I'll post it. I'll let you guys know. Um, one of the implant design that's really, really been good that hasn't fractured yet, having said I haven't placed enough, is a Strawman 3.3. 3.3, uh, Strawman 3.3, um, they're, they're absolutely rock solid. No pun intended, okay? <laughs> rock solid. Uh, and I believed that a Megagen BDO implant, which is a very similar wall design as a um, uh, uh, the Strawman 3.3 BLTs, I think they're just as strong. So I'll be doing some studies on 3.3. There's 3.3 as well. Okay. Um. Now that brings to AGD code one CE. Okay, it's a LCS two one three five four zero. Understand the code? Late night coffee show, right? 2021 3.5 millimeter diameter implant versus 4.0 diameter implant okay yeah if you need to remember lcs 213540 okay so i'm going to uh, send this code to angela uh and please email angela at info at uh, uh, dot com, uh requesting uh the ce certificate one ce with this uh, verification code and she will email to you and you can submit it and get your agdc credit Okay, hopefully you guys have a good time. Uh, if any questions, stick around and, uh, you know, let me know if I can answer any questions. Okay, I'll leave this. Um, uh, oh, there's one quick question from uh, Nugent. Okay, let me, I think this is worthwhile right here. If sticky bone is not used in this case, should immediate implant be placed or should it be staged out? Oh, no, if you're good with the membrane, you can do a poncho and membrane and uh, put the uh, the bone and you can still do it. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't stage it, guys. Okay, I used to do a, you know, a lot of these even without sticky bone. It's just a sticky bone. It's easier. Okay, so what that gonna, you're going to take additional 15 minutes, you can do it in two minutes, right? Two to five minutes. It's just easier, right? Um... And uh, oh yeah, guys. Um, yeah, you know, I'll leave. Uh, I'll. I'm glad a lot of you guys enjoyed it. Okay, I'll leave the the lecture until uh, probably midnight tonight. Okay, or maybe midnight tomorrow. Okay, tomorrow night. So if you kind of watch, want to watch it again, go right ahead. Uh, and I hope to see you guys again. Uh, in one, one week later, I'll try to do my best to uh, a regular Sunday and in the future if you guys want maybe I can do a Sunday morning live show instead of Sunday evening because I can do Sunday morning like 7 o'clock early in the morning before my daughter wakes up so that those times works out good for me too so you leave a comment if you guys want morning versus evening so I can do you know I can be fair to all of you guys okay I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it thank you as always all right thank you as always um, yeah had a great fun. Hope you guys learned something. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.